Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is not like anything I've done before here on my channel because this case involves a missing person who is not a victim but a fugitive. Um, I feel like this entire story is incredibly scary um, just because it's something that can literally happen to anybody. I know I say that with a lot of cases, but in a lot of the cases, it's kind of like, well, you know, your behavior or a situation that you put yourself in can cause something to happen. But with this case, the victim literally was not doing absolutely anything out of the ordinary, out of what any of us are doing on almost a daily basis. I also think that this is a case that we can all learn from in terms of not everything is worth fighting over. Not everything that someone does to make you upset is worth confronting them over. People need to learn to control their anger and they need to realize that if they do take something the wrong way and their actions cause something to happen completely out of proportion from what should have happened, that they need to take responsibility for their own actions. Today's case involves a man who does exactly the opposite of everything I just said, and it's incredibly infuriating. So, with all of that being said, let's just get right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the events that led up to and resulted from the death of Jason Bass. So I'm starting this a little bit differently than I normally do. I'm going to start off by introducing you to the bad guy first because we need to understand the type of person that Adam was to understand everything that happened in this case. Adam Emery was a 27-year-old customer service rep with Todd Enterprises, a plastics manufacturer. Adam Emery was born into an upper-class family. His family had owned a few general stores and just had some overall good business dealings, and even though they weren't rich, they didn't struggle too hard with money. Now, according to some old friends from school, Adam was the type of guy who was very good-looking, and he was well aware of that. He was six feet tall, had a solid build, had dark brown hair with bright blue eyes. He was described as being a bit obsessive with his looks, always making sure that he was perfectly fit, working out almost every day, and presented himself in a very, very particular way. He enjoyed skiing and was very skilled in martial arts. At one point, he was a military officer with the National Guard, and then he went on to attend night classes at Rhode Island College for business while working as a carpenter during the day. He had also picked up some shifts at the college's coffee house during the time that he was spending at classes. Then, after graduating, he went into the Army and then served for three years. Then, after that, he landed the job that I mentioned earlier as a customer service rep. At some point, Adam met a very special lady named Alina at a disco called Berries, and in 1988, the two had gotten married. At the time that everything happened, Adam was living with Alina in a ground floor apartment in a white colonial style house in the strip mall and suburb of Cranston, which was the same house that Elena's own parents had once lived in. Now, Elena, she was born in Italy into a family of five brothers and sisters. She came to the U.S. when she was very young in the 60s. Her parents had struggled to make a good life for the family, but they had the American dream in mind and they just completely made it work. Her mother worked long hours at the soap factory where she actually still works today, and her father worked construction. Eventually, all of this hard work and dedication paid off, and the family was able to afford a house in Western Cranston, which was the area that housed many Italian immigrants. Alina had helped out with her dad's construction company while attending college. Then, after being married to Adam, she worked as an office manager at a construction company, I'm not exactly sure if it was at her father's construction company, but I would assume it wasn't really specified. Now, she too was described as being very concerned with her appearance. She was always having big hair and wearing a lot of makeup, and the two seemed to have a very, very good marriage, even being described as perfect for one another and two peas in a pod. So, something important about Adam is that he was absolutely in love with his car. He had a 1985 Black Thunderbird. To say that this car was his absolute pride and joy was an understatement. He was obsessed with it, and to him, this car was absolute perfection. 
Adam was proud of his perfect appearance, his perfect wife, his perfect car, and his perfect life. So with a lot of these cases, it is very easy to focus on the person responsible for everything that happened and technically that is who this video is about. However, I wanna go ahead and dedicate some time to the victim because I haven't heard a lot of you know articles or retellings of this case where they actually really kind of focus on the victim for a little bit. It's usually only about Adam. I honestly had to do a little bit of digging to find any sort of information about Jason, but I'm going to use everything that I was able to find to tell you a little bit more about Jason. So Jason Bass was a 20 year old man of native heritage who was from a large family with six brothers and sisters and he was known to be such a mama's boy. He collected football cards and he absolutely loved cooking and he had a dream of someday opening up his own diner. When he was 16 years old, he had actually dropped out of high school and became a cook at Burger King, then moving on to a store called Mr. Donuts where he fried donuts. In the summer before everything happened, he had been hired as a manager at a food concession stand at the Rocky Point Amusement Park in Warwick. He was known to be a kid at heart and he absolutely loved working at Rocky Point because his nieces and nephews could get in for half price and he always got to take home a bunch of free food. But in the week before he died, he had actually quit his job at Rocky Point. Now, on August 31st, 1990, Jason had called his sister and told her that she was going to be stopping by for dinner, but he actually never did. Instead, he and his cousin Josh had just been playing Nintendo all day, and then they decided to go ahead and pick up Josh's 15-year-old friend, John, who managed Dell's Lemonade Stand at the amusement park. So they took his dark red 1975 Ford LTD with a white top and blue stones on the dashboard and headed that way. When they arrived at the Rocky Point Amusement Park, of course, they had picked up the friend John, and he got into the backseat of the car and they all just, you know, started listening to rap music on the radio and just started hanging out and having a good time and talking and eating and, you know, doing all the stuff that teenage boys do. This is also when his paths would cross with a man who would ultimately take his life for absolutely no reason at all. So now let's switch back to Adam. Also on August 31st, 1990, Adam and Elena, along with Elena's sister and her husband, had also decided to go to Rocky Point to celebrate Adam and Elena's second year of marriage. What better way to celebrate than to go to Rocky Point, eat some greasy, unhealthy food, and just look out at the water like so many Rhode Islanders did? So they had stopped at a local restaurant to go ahead and get some food. Adam had gotten chowder, while the rest had gotten clam cakes, which was what Rocky Point was famous for. They were all just sitting in their car, eating their food and drinking beer and just chatting and having a good time as well, when suddenly they felt a jolt from behind. Another car had sideswiped the rear driver's side of Adam's beloved 1985 Ford Thunderbird. Now, this was a very dark and foggy night so it wasn't totally clear out. So the driver of whoever hit them maybe didn't see them at first or whatever it was, and they didn't see them very well. However, even after hitting a parked car, this driver just drove away, which is honestly pretty rude and inconsiderate. Clearly this person felt themselves hitting this parked car. And I guess I should have mentioned that they were parked in the car in the parking lot eating their food and drinking beer. They weren't driving around or anything like that. So this person just hit them while they were parked. As soon as they looked up though, they saw this car speeding away and then disappearing behind the corner of a building. At this point, everyone in the car was very rightfully upset, but they were encouraging Adam to go chase down this other a-hole driver. So they sped in the direction that they saw this other car go turned the corner of the building and they saw a red 1975 Ford LTD. When they saw that, Elena shouted out, that's the car. This was the car that had belonged to 20 year old Jason Bass. Adam had followed this car out of Rocky Point and then started chasing them through the streets into a small neighborhood called Conmacut. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. So he said initially that he was just following the car so that he could get the license plate number and then report it to police later as most people would do. But the more Adam followed, 
the more freaked out Jason got and started speeding away. In Jason's car, Josh is screaming, what the hell is this guy's problem? He's ready to beef. However, after two miles of relentlessly chasing down this car and flashing his headlights to him to try and get this car to stop, Adam went ahead and cut in front of Jason's car, forcing him to stop on the side of the residential streets. Once they stopped, Adam got out of the car to head over to Jason's car, but then Alina yelled to him that he should take his small survival knife with him in his pocket. Then, at this point, there are a little bit of differences to how this entire thing happened. So, as he was approaching Jason's car, Adam said that he was just walking very calmly and just said to Jason, I just want to talk to you, you hit my car. But then Josh and John claim that Adam was running up to the car very aggressively saying, I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna kick your ass. Jason then gunned his car into reverse to try and get away from this man who he was very clearly threatened by but Adam was not about to give up. He said that he reached into the driver's side window of Jason's car, saying that he just wanted to turn off the ignition, but as Jason kept going, he was dragged along for the ride, hanging out of the side of the door. So try and picture this as he's backing up, Half of Adam's body is leaning into this young man's car while Jason and everybody else is screaming hysterically. Apparently, Adam had yelled to them that he has a knife and that they should probably stop, but he did not stop the car. According to Adam, he felt that he had to react. He had no choice. He had to do something because this kid did not listen to his warning. So as he was being dragged, he was able to reach into his pocket. He took out his survival knife and then he stabbed Jason once in the left arm and then again directly into his chest. The car finally stopped when it slammed into a boulder after dragging Adam 1300 feet down the road. Adam, now completely covered in blood, knife still in hand, is finally free from the car. Now, imagine witnessing all of this in front of your house because someone actually did. As he was standing there, he saw a man named Bruce Bishop standing in the driveway that Jason's car was parked directly in front of. Turns out Bruce Bishop was actually also a prison guard. He yells to Adam to drop the knife, and he did before admitting that he had just stabbed Jason and then asked Bruce Bishop for a cup of water. Then somehow Jason gathers enough strength to get out of the car and he staggered around for a little bit saying that he felt very weak. He had already lost a ton of blood and was in very, very, very bad condition. An ambulance was called, but it was too late because Jason was already dead by the time they had reached Rhode Island Hospital at 9.37 p.m. However, if that's not bad enough, the absolute punch to the gut when it comes to this case is that Jason actually was not the one who had hit Adam's car at all. Police had later compared the paint transferred onto Adam's car to the paint on Jason's car, and it did not match whatsoever. So not only was killing someone for hitting your car absolutely unjustified, this case goes even further when you hear that the only thing that Jason was guilty of was happening to drive past a very angry Adam at the wrong time. Which, just as a quick side note, is absolutely terrifying. Like I said in my intro, this is something that can happen to absolutely anyone. And I know that whenever I notice someone riding my tail or following me for too many turns, I get absolutely terrified even if I didn't do anything. I had a time where I was on the highway and some guy had just randomly started getting really close to me as I was already going 80 and then he would like speed up to like a hundred in a construction zone to get past me and then swerved in front of me as close as he possibly could and then would slam on his brakes and cause us both to go super slow and he did this for like five miles before I finally found an exit to finally get off at and it was probably one of the most terrifying things to happen while I was driving because I literally had no idea what I did. 
and you know maybe I accidentally cut them off or something that I didn't even realize that I did but I genuinely had no idea and I'm already a very anxious driver so thinking that people get this angry and then can go as far as killing someone is just a very very scary and real thing that we all just have to live with. So anyways, before my heart starts pounding and I have a literal panic attack, let's talk about the trial. So the trial for Jason's murder was two and a half years after the incident. In the meantime, Adam had spent about eight months in jail, but then Adam and Elena's families were able to raise $27,000 for his bail by putting up their house as collateral. After that, life for Adam seemed to go on pretty much as normal. He didn't seem too frazzled about what happened at all. According to those around him, he was completely normal. He went back to work and even got a promotion while he was there. So life was going pretty great for Adam at that point. So the trial started on November 5th, 1993. Of course, Adam's defense came in saying that Adam stabbing Jason was completely out of self-defense because he was scared of being harmed while he was being dragged by the car. They said that even though Jason wasn't the one who hit their car, and yes, they did acknowledge this, they said that this was justified because Adam thought that Jason was the one who had hit his car, so he didn't knowingly go after an innocent man. However, the prosecution argued that Adam is the one that put Adam into this situation. He doesn't get to claim self-defense when he's the one who put a knife in his pocket, confronted a driver, and then leaned into his window. And just as a quick side note, you know, I obviously don't know which side to believe of how Adam went about this, but you can imagine that if you're angry enough to speed and chase a car down all of these different roads, that you're not just gonna get out of the car and calmly walk over them and say, hey, um, just so you know, you know, I tend to believe more that he was very angry, that he bum rushed over to the car and was just trying to scare Jason and probably saw that he was a kid, so he probably thought that, you know, it was gonna be easy. But, I mean, there's no reason that Jason would have slammed into reverse and tried to get out of there so fast if this guy was just completely calm and normal about it. Jason could have explained, you know, I didn't hit you, that wasn't me. Maybe it, you know, would have escalated from there, I don't know, but I tend to believe that he didn't just calmly walk over there. So again, you know, the prosecution saying that Adam was the one that put him in this situation is 100% correct. So it was reported that throughout the entirety of this five-day trial, Adam never once showed any sort of guilt or emotion or any sort of remorse for what he had done. He was completely adamant that he was simply defending himself and that Jason was the one who was solely at fault for all of this happening. At the end of those five days, November 10th, 1933, also Adam's 31st birthday, The jury came back with a guilty verdict for second degree murder, finding that even if it was just for a split second, Adam did show the intent of trying to kill Jason. Alina wasn't in trouble. I don't think she was going to go on trial for anything at this point. She wasn't found guilty of accessory or anything like that for her role in encouraging Adam to bring the knife. Now, for most, this would be seen as a complete victory. There was justice being served for a young, innocent man who lost his life for absolutely no reason at the hands of someone who was just out of control, angry. However, to Alina and their families, this was an absolute misjustice, and they were not afraid to express this in court in the most rude and disrespectful ways that they possibly could. Alina screamed out to the jury and said, this is my fault and there will be hell to be paid. Alina's mother, in equally dramatic and sensational fashion, fell to her knees and wailed, oh god, oh god, oh god, help my son-in-law, he is not a bad person. Then, to top it all off, Adam's brother-in-law directly screamed at the Bass family and said, you effing scumbags, we're going to get you. I had also read that even, you know, before the trial and after the trial, when the two families 
had seen each other. There was one instance where one of Adam's sisters had seen, you know, one of Jason's family members and started screaming at them for their role in getting his brother, you know, in trial and, you know, for having this all this happen, saying that was Jason's fault. And I can't even imagine the harassment that they felt when, after losing their son for absolutely no reason. But because of all of the semantics in court, the Bass family had to be escorted out of the courtroom and police had to stay at their home that night to make sure that no one was gonna come in and hurt them. I will note that Adam's family actually did stay quiet throughout the entire trial. They, you know, weren't screaming or anything. It was only Alina's family that was being loud and dramatic and disrespectful. But as you can imagine, Adam's family still thought that he didn't do anything wrong and thought that everything that happened was Jason's own fault. So at this point, they hadn't actually reached the actual sentencing phase yet. But for this crime, Jason was facing up to 20 years in prison. So awaiting the sentencing phase, once again, Jason was released on bail which is crazy to me because not only did he kill someone, but it was in a fit of rage that he did so. He was very clearly a loose cannon who clearly had the potential to do it again. Plus his wife's whole family was threatening and screaming at the family of the victim. So he clearly also had people who were able to work him up just like Alina had did when they confronted Jason in the first place. But for whatever reason, our justice system lets people like this go home. So at around 3 p.m. that day, they left the courtroom and they went home, but Adam and Alina did not stay put for long. About a half hour later, Alina and Adam walked into a sporting goods store and purchased sweatsuits, athletic socks, and strap-on exercise weights weighing a total of 80 pounds. According to an employee, the two walked into the store pretty much knowing exactly what they wanted. You know, they didn't put up a fuss, they weren't searching around or anything like that. He also said that when Adam saw the total after ringing them up for all these items, he was very upset for how expensive all of this was. Then, about a half hour after that, the two were seen eating at a local restaurant I think they said it was at Burger King. And then they were seen again at the Newport Bridge that stood 215 feet above the Narragansett Bay. At around 5.15 p.m., they were seen driving away from that area, but they did return back later. At 6.53 p.m. that same evening, Adam's car was reported abandoned on the side of that Newport Bridge. When police arrived, they found the car still running with the headlights still on. In the car, they found the clothes that each of them had worn to court neatly folded in the back seat. On the front seat, they found cash, a cut up credit card, and Adam's driver's license. It, at this point, was clear to police that the couple had jumped from the bridge, so they searched the water for any sign of that, but they didn't actually end up finding anything. So, Alina's family was very upset with all of this and they really wanted to find their bodies. So they went ahead and spent another $15,000 that they, by the way, did not have to have another search of the water, putting up even more things in collateral and, you know, risking going into financial ruins to try and find their bodies. But again, this search came up with nothing. So a few days later, suicide notes from both Alina and Adam had arrived in the mail to the couple's loved ones. And obviously the families were very upset after receiving all of these. However, police and basically everyone else outside of the family thought that there had to be something else going on here. Their behavior right before this happened just did not seem with the motive of them wanting to take their own lives. Why would Adam be upset about the price of the things that they just bought if, you know, later that day they were going to end their lives and it really didn't matter? Plus, think of the time that the car was found and when they were spotted there. It was rush hour or just right after rush hour and a lot of people would have been passing by at the time that they jumped, yet somehow no one reported seeing it. Additionally, they were seen at this restaurant, at Burger King of any restaurant, 
they were seen smiling and happy and having a very normal conversation. It didn't seem like normal behavior for a couple that was getting ready to do something huge like this. Plus, I also want to mention that even though police didn't have a search warrant to search Adam's home, an officer noticed that Adam had his passport sitting on his desk clear as day. Then, lastly, in court, Adam and Alina had obviously been continuously talking to one another throughout the entire thing. Right before he was charged with second degree murder and was released on bond awaiting sentencing, Alina had said something to Adam that no one could quite hear. However, investigators brought in a woman who was hearing impaired, who did this kind of thing for work, to watch the court videos to lip read to try and figure out what Alina was saying. She believed that Alina said, we're going to do what we originally said, you promised me, which some think was a suicide pact. Now, nine months after the couple went missing, a fisherman came across two human leg bones. One of the bones still had remnants of an athletic sock that looked just like the one that Adam had just bought. However, after further testing, they determined that the bone hadn't been in the water long enough for it to have been sitting there for nine months, which is when Adam would have jumped, and they thought that it belonged to a man who was much shorter than Adam was. But then, on August 30th, 1994, a human skull was actually pulled out of Narragansett Bay. After testing, the medical examiner was very confident that the skull did in fact belong to Alina. But then this leaves the question, where's Adam? Did he actually jump off the bridge that day with his wife? Or is he somewhere else? Alina's family believes that he did jump. They think that they were so absolutely in love that there's absolutely no way that he could live apart from her. But then, on the other hand, many people believe that he did actually run. So there is a few reasons why people believe this other than the fact that his remains hadn't been found. First of all, we know that he was very self-absorbed and this just did not seem like the type of guy who would want to take his own life rather than just running. Plus, according to the lip reader, Alina was the one who was trying to push all of this in the first place. At first, no one was really sure if this was a suicide pact, so she was going into this, or she did say that Alina said this, not knowing, you know, if it was a suicide pact or if it was a plan to run away, but obviously after they had found Alina's skull, they were confident that it was a suicide pact. But it seemed to be her idea nonetheless. She asked him to promise her, so that just makes it clear that he at least had some doubts. Plus, throughout the trial, she was completely just torn up that Adam was going to jail and felt that this entire thing was just her fault. She showed remorse, but not for the person who had died, but because the man that she loved was going to jail, and in her mind, it was all of her fault because, again, she was the one that encouraged him to bring the knife. And then, on the other hand, he genuinely didn't think that he did anything wrong. So I could see him running away to simply avoid going to jail, but I don't know if I could see him taking his own life. So the main theory with this is that Adam did make this promise to his wife and that the two had driven there together, but then maybe Adam just pushed her off the bridge and ran, or maybe because she felt so guilty, she jumped willingly when Adam maybe changed his mind at the last minute, or maybe she jumped thinking that Adam was right behind her or was going to jump with her, and then he didn't, but obviously once she jumped, there's nothing that she could do to go back and get him. So she ended up doing it by herself, thinking that Adam was going to do it with her. But people believe that any of these reasons could be why they only found Alina's remains. But also at the same time, again, everyone who knew the couple knew that they were so absolutely in love and they thought it was just a ridiculous accusation that people were making. But who knows? By 2004, Adam Emery was legally classified as being dead. But then in 2010, the FBI had actually received some new information that 
made them believe that he was in fact alive and well. He had been on the most wanted list before and after receiving this new information, he was right back on that list. I don't know what all of this information was, but it must be pretty significant. Apparently, there had been several credible sightings of him and the FBI stated that they have absolutely no reason to believe that he is in fact dead. They think that he's either in Italy or in Florida, which is huge because again, the FBI just doesn't come out and say things like that willy-nilly. They must have very strong reason to believe that. As of right now, the FBI is still looking for Adam Emery and they are still asking for tips. They added his picture to a deck of cold case playing cards, each of which tells the story of an unsolved homicide or a missing persons case in Rhode Island. Adam Emery is wanted by the FBI for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution and second degree murder. He is described as having brown hair and blue eyes standing at six feet one inch tall, weighing 175 pounds. As of right now, he would be 57 years old. He should be considered armed and dangerous, so don't approach this man if you see him. The FBI asks that if you have any information regarding Adam, to contact your local FBI office or the nearest American embassy. Well, I have never done a description and a missing persons flyer for someone who was a wanted criminal before, but you never know what you're going to get yourself into with these cases. As always, my heart absolutely goes out to Jason and his family. His life was taken selfishly from him for absolutely no reason. And I do think that the jury was correct with charging Adam of second degree murder because that's what he did. He murdered Jason. But anyways, that is all I have for today's video. And now I want to know your guys' thoughts. Do you think that Adam did jump off the bridge with Alina and that we're still waiting to find his remains? Or do you think he ran off and is a wanted fugitive? Please let me know your thoughts in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.